Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us on this wonderful fall afternoon. Oops. I, it's, <laughs> with a, you know how life with a mask has really changed, right? <laughs> uh, I'm, my name is Debbie Hewling, for those of you who don't know me. On behalf of the Los Alamos Historical Society, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce you to two very, very special people, Thor Klein and Lena Verma. I had the great pleasure of meeting them on a very cold day in December of 2016 when they joined me on one of my walking tours while researching their next film, Adventures of a Mathematician. Thor is a graduate of the prestigious Film and Television Academy in Berlin. His debut feature film was Lost Place, the first German mystery thriller shot in 3D and mixed with Dolby Atmos. His second feature film, Adventures of a Mathematician, is being released in the US this week and will have a pre-release premiere at Ashley Pond on Thursday evening, sponsored by the county. Thor's screenplay, Ghosts of India, won the Indo-German Screenplay Award, was granted development funding, and got selected for the Reykjavik International Film Festival Talent Lab in 2015. Leonora will be his next film based on Elena Poniatowska's, I probably butchered that, a novel about key female, female surrealist Leonora Carrington. Lena is an award-winning Swiss producer and also a graduate of the Film and Television Academy in Berlin. Her first feature, Lost Place, earned her the nomination for the No Fear Producers Award. Leonora will be her fourth feature film as lead producer. Lena and her Berlin-based fil film production company, Dragonfly Films, received the VGF's highest endowed German award for up-and-coming producers for the film that they are here to promote this week. And I'm thinking that's an equivalent to an Oscar, is it not? <laughs> Almost. Almost. Not there yet. <laughs> uh, Lena is a recurrent lecturer for the Film and Television Academy and the Met Film School in Berlin. Please join me in welcoming Thor and Lena back to a place they love, Los Alamos and the state of New Mexico. Well, wow. Thank you so much, Debbie, for having us here. And uh, thank you for the Los Alamos Historical Society for putting up this incredible event. And thank you for all of you showing up with like so many people. We, we thought, like, OK, we might be here maybe with 10 people, but this is like really incredible. So thank you for being here and listening to us. And uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing to be back in Los Alamos. Yeah, um, as Debbie mentioned, it started for us about five years ago when we um, first came here after we decided to, uh, to turn Stan's book into a film. And um, we received great support from the start. I mean, there was Debbie, the State of the Archive, the, National, the, the Los Alamos Archive, and uh, also I had um, the honor to, to meet with Claire, with the daughter of Stan, who, uh, who became really um, a great supporter for us, and without her, we, we wouldn't have it wouldn't have been possible to make the film in the way we did. So yeah, we're here today to um, show you a little bit uh, the magic behind the curtain <laughs> and um, tell you a little bit about the, the, the development of the film and uh, the shooting of the film. Um, and to make the screening uh, at, uh, on Thursday to, uh, to make it into something very special for you. So yeah, we should probably just start with this. Yeah, so I would suggest, I don't know if everybody saw the trailer yet, but we thought we were going to play for you just to kind of get into the feeling and show you the magic of the film and then we kind of go behind the scenes and you see that everything is a lie, basically. Um, but yeah, we're going to show you the trailer right now. I'm just going to wait for the light. What question? Yes? So, I wonder if you and the audience would be comfortable if you took off your masks? I don't know. If, I mean, we're far away. We're are, you, are you guys okay with that if they remove yeah. their masks while they talk? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we're, okay. we're vaccinated, tested, 
every second day, so and we stay far away from you, so you're fine. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Gambling is all about probability. Every game you play tells you something. Let us invade Russia. The Germans will have the resources from World War. What is the plan with this one? It is about having it before Hitler does. My teacher here, when my hometown is invaded by Germans, they are hiring mathematicians right now, many people like that. Yeah, so um, basically it started a really long time ago, uh, when I was about 13 years old, in my hometown, which um, you see here. It's uh, called Kaiserslautern, and it's in the southwestern part of Germany. It's, um, it's, it's actually it's a, it's a place where you still to this day have the biggest US military base outside of the US, uh, Rammstein Air Base, some people might have heard of it. So, um, yeah, from, from, from an early age on, I was um, confronted with, you know, the Cold War and, and all the, the, the topics of, of nuclear weapons in the neighborhoods. But, um, yeah, when I was about 13 years old, I, I found a book in the library in my hometown. It's called uh, Who Got Einstein's Office? And in this book, um, there were, um, it was basically about the, the place called the Institute for Advanced Studies on the East Coast. And uh, it was about the, the, the history of that place and also all the people who went there, among them Stan and Johnny. And uh, I was quite fascinated by it back then uh, because uh, they were driving fast cars, uh, cars and uh, they were heading, they had parties and all of that. And um, I thought, actually, uh, they are so very different from the math teachers in school. So uh, <laughs> I thought uh, maybe I should, uh, I should become a mathematician. So. Um, it was, uh, and also I have to say, it, um, it got me to uh, smoke my first cigarettes because I thought that uh, there must be a correlation between smoking and heavy thinking. And um, <laughs> yeah, it made me, in this summer when I discovered the book, it made me uh, try my first cigarette. I, I, I just um, got a cigarette uh, from my mother without her knowing that it, obviously, and tried it. And I thought, okay, this is my first step to become a mathematician. <laughs> but apparently I was not very good in mathematics in school. But I thought maybe I'm uh, just a late riser, you know, and um, you know, it will, it, will, it will happen because I was clearly interested in it. 
and um, I was living this lie until I was about 16 and I was sitting next to a guy in school who was actually very talented in mathematics and when we had to do um, some kind of test he would just start and after 20 minutes he was finished and I was still trying to figure out what, uh, what I had to do. So uh, it was quite traumatic for me to, um, to realize that. But at the same time I had a great literature teacher and he made me aware that I was probably more interested in these people and their stories and all of that. And uh, that was a great relief um, and so I kept reading, <laughs> reading about it. And um, of course when I got older I realized behind the parties and the fast cars there was incredible tragedy because they all at the time when they were there, they, they either lost their families or they, they had no possibility to get in touch with them. So it was their friendships were the substitute for their families. And um, when I was in film school, I discovered uh, Stan's book, Adventures of a Mathematician. And it had uh, this beautiful friendship in it between Stan and Johnny. And uh, I, I really fell in love with it and I thought this is actually this, this, I should, we should, I should do this, I should make a film out of this. But uh, when you're in film school, it's not that you have the resources to option books or anything. I mean, you, you really, you, it's just not, not the case. So I, I talked to Lena and um, then uh, she, uh, she took over more or less for her. <laughs> yeah, well, it was also the first time for me to get into what does it mean to adapt a book into a movie and get the rights and I had to do research who has the rights to the book um, I found out it's the UC Press in Berkeley so I got in touch with them and like negotiated like crazy to get the rights and um, what we didn't know back then is that actually the publisher had to ask Claire Weiner Ulam the daughter of Stan um, if she, she agrees to uh, make this book into a film we met her only later but this was kind of I guess the first connection and that she knew something is going on um, but yeah I managed and um, then that was 2016 in fall and I think the first thing we actually did is coming here because we knew there's the book but there's also a lot of things between the lines like reading between the lines and we wanted to find out what is that and also I think when he wrote it there were still a lot of things classified so what we, went, what we wanted to do is come here and talk to as many people as possible and go into archives and um, here you can actually see a photo um, in the museum shop <laughs> where we were uh, asking around. Like I think this was the question of were there any um, street la lights during yeah. the time <laughs> when Stan was wandering the streets of Los Alamos so that was actually the question asked. And yeah, why don't you tell everybody a bit more about the whole research process because we were not only here, but like Thor was all over the world basically for it. Yeah, so we, um, we started here in New Mexico and then um, I uh, wrote a first draft of the screenplay and we submitted it to, um, to the Sloan Foundation, which is a big um, foundation in the US that supports science related uh, films. And uh, we we got a prize, um, and that allowed it, that gave us the possibility, um, also money-wise, to do research and travel to all the places. And I was also getting in touch with um, Stan's nephew Alex, who's a journalist in New York. And um, so we traveled together to to Stan's hometown, Lviv, which was in back in the days called Lviv, and it was in Poland. And these days it's in the Ukraine. So um, we went there together and, uh, and, and uh, I, did, I did research there and also Alex um, basically introduced me to a lot of materials within the possession of the family and uh, that allowed me to get also an idea about Stan's situation back then. And um, I then traveled to the US again uh, and, and went to all these different archives, you know, to the, the Institute of Advanced Study and also to the uh, very beautiful place, the um, American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia um, and the Library of Congress, of course. And I met a lot of um, very old mathematicians. <laughs> they were in their, a lot of them were in their, of course, in their, in their mid to late 80s. Um, some like Freeman Dyson, for example, in his, in his 90s. 
But it was incredible how sharp they all still were when it came to mathematics and to, to, to the time back then. Uh, it, it clearly told me that this was a very, very special time and uh, they shared and uh, uh, it, it did something to them. Uh, apart from, from all the moral issues where we, we, we get into later, but it also, there was a very a special bond formed between all these people that I could realize from the start. And um, yeah, so during, during, uh, during uh, the research, of course, um, the, the, my insight in the whole thing grew and grew and um, I discovered all these new layers in it, which you don't have. Um, when you read the book, uh, you, you, because Stan had a very uh, particular way of, of being and dealing with, with stuff, he had a great sense of humor, obviously, and uh, the book is very anecdotical. But uh, to, to understand the context, you need to dig a bit deeper and um, to, to talk to, uh, to people who were actually there. And so, um, yeah, so, so we, we ended up with um, a lot of material and uh, a lot of ideas that, um, that I had to put in a, in a, in a screenplay. And um, yeah, we... We, um... we had so many scenes with so many great minds in the screenplay and at one point we just kind of had to uh, kind of delete a lot of scenes because the, the screenplay grew and grew and grew and we had amazing characters in it. I mean we had scenes with Einstein, we had scenes with en Enrico Fermi, um, Bradbury I think uh, was, was in it as well, um, it still kind of is but very short. But uh, so yeah, so we kind of had to somehow compress everything and put it in a film that is actually shootable for us um, as we don't have a big studio in the background we just kind of are we, we both of us we were developing this together and, and thinking of okay how can we turn this into a film and find financing which is kind of my job as well so uh, yeah so what we did is with the support of slow and in development and we got a great um, science mentor historian George Dyson, the son of Freeman Dyson, who was of a big help for us uh, in, in all the questions we had besides uh, all the archives Thor had access to. And yeah, I think the next thing is we put together this project, um, put together an international team. Do you want to say something about it? Sure. sure. It was, uh, to me, it was clear from the beginning that um, the that that we would have Polish actor, a Polish actor playing Stan, because there's in my, I mean, there was, there's no point for me in 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 denying the fact that that uh, there were all these people came from different countries, spoke different different languages, and they were immigrants essentially, and so um, we we looked around early on for a, for an actor in, in Poland. Um, and also, because Stan was um, was was from Eastern Europe, I I I, I wanted to to have a, a clash between this landscape and the Eastern European way of also cinematically of approaching that. And so I, I knew I wanted to have a, a cinematographer from from Eastern Europe to shoot the film. And so all these parts came together and uh, we had to, of course we had to find these these people which took us a long time it's about a, i think it would, it's roughly about a year until we had the whole team assembled it was a bit like building the atomic bomb to be honest because, <laughs> yeah, yeah because also it's a clash of mentalities you know it's a it's a very different way of dealing with with um, with this task um, I think that there's this quote from from Stan that I that I uh, wrote somewhere that when he came when he worked in, uh, in, in in Los Alamos he said he learned a lot about timetables and about practical stuff and how to you know how to uh, he was he was a free thinker as a, as, as, as um, you know, a lot of you might know and uh, he was not the type of person who would fit into a nine to five schedule he had his own way of. Of, of working, and that's also a little bit what, what I want to grasp in the, in the film, these different mentalities. So yeah, so what we did in the end, um, well the first idea was that we do a German, because we are based in Germany, uh, German-Polish because of the topic of Stan Gulam, so we thought we need Poles to kind of give also their uh, mindset and culture into the film. 
uh, so German-Polish co-production. And then, of course, uh, we wanted to do something with North America because we thought, well, the whole story takes place in, in the US, but it's very difficult to actually work together with Americans on a film level. No. <laughs> it's, it's just they are not used uh, to the whole government funding system we are used uh, in producing films. So the genius idea I had was to um, hook up with Canada because they are kind of more European oriented when it comes to financing a film. I might get too much into details here, but um, in the end it didn't work out with Canada. Um, US was too difficult to get like money out of the US, um, so we kind of knew, okay, we have to do it differently and we already have money from Germany and we had already money from Poland, so we knew most of it we have to shoot in Germany and Poland and just pretend to be in the US, because um, as an independent production it is very expensive to travel with the whole crew and the cast, of course, um, so yeah, so we thought, okay, we tried to make it happen in Germany and Poland, and then got a British co-producer um, to do the whole post-production in London. So that was kind of the setup. So we had already a very international team, and then we had a cinematographer from Romania in the end, and uh, of course we had we had a French editor. Um, yeah, I think it was. What else did we have? We had a Polish costume designer. Polish costume designer, yeah, we had a lot of Polish crew, we had a lot of German crew. And then the actors also, uh, what we tried to do is to stay as close as possible to the country the character is from. Didn't work out in all the characters or actors, but like this, the, the main lead actor is Polish. Um, John von Neumann is actually played by a Pole, even though he was Hungarian. But the Poles don't really know that actor, so they thought themselves he's a Hungarian actor, which kind of worked out fine for us. <laughs> um, so yeah, so, so we kind of put together the whole crew and the cast, and then we came back to Los Alamos to do research on, okay, how do we build Los Alamos in Germany? Yeah, so we took a lot of pictures of um, the floor and, and looked at all kinds of details to really get everything right. Also, the way the light uh, falls to the ground in New Mexico is quite special. And uh, we also wanted to get this, this right. So uh, we, we really put a lot of effort in the details and we looked in Germany. We looked at so many places because the thing is we knew Los Alamos was on a plateau, so we needed a wide space that, that really has depth. And, and uh, we uh, we looked at a, at a lot of places, and it took us also m months to to um, to find a few candidates. In the end, it um, we found a former Russian airfield in uh, in the eastern part of uh, Germany, which is kind of ironic if you think that it's uh, <laughs> it was supposed to be a, a, the most secret military place in the U.S. And we shot it on a on a Russian former Russian airfield that was also quite a secret back in the days. Um, but uh, yeah, that that uh, that allowed us. The location was fantastic because since it was an um, an old airfield, it also had some buildings there we could use for the crew and and the technical stuff. And I um, I knew from the start that uh, with my production designer that I wanted to copy. These, the, the, the style back then, the, the, prefab, the prefab house they had. I found this photo in the archive here in, um, in Los Alamos and I told my production designer I really want to copy this to the, to the, to the detail. This is, and um, so we had to find people in Germany who know how to build that. I mean, the advantage was since it was prefab, since it felt a bit makeshift back then, it was just in the, in the process of, of being built, that helped us a little bit because <laughs> That's also what you do in film. You you kind of you have to set up these these uh, backdrops in a, in a in a very short time. But the tricky, the most complicated part uh, were the were actually the cars. You know, we needed we knew we need a lot of cars, and uh, it's it's quite difficult to find uh, these amount uh, these amounts of cars in in, in Germany. But uh, but we, we managed and. Um, yeah, it, uh, it, it was quite amazing to see how all this, this developed. And 
the other thing, the key thing, obviously, the key location for us was the, the Fuller Lodge, this very place. And we knew we would shoot it in a studio in Germany, but also I brought my, my production designer here and I brought the DP here and they looked also at all the details. And uh, so everybody who worked on that film in, in, as a head of department was here and has seen everything to, um, to make so that I could be sure that it really holds up. And, uh, yeah, and I think um, rebuilding the prefab roads in Brandenburg, in Germany, uh, I mean, we would have had to rebuild it here anyways as well. As you know, Los Alamos is, has developed and uh, it doesn't look like back then anymore. I mean, this is really fantastic, of course. We would have loved to shoot here, but it was just like, yeah, we, we couldn't find the money to do it. So, uh, yeah, so this is actually um, kind of part of the rebuilding of the prefab road uh, in the back, you can see. Um, and then, oh yeah, and here it's kind of finished. And right when it was finished, um, on the second day of shoot, in the evening, um, we had a fire <laughs> right next to the prefab road. Um, it was very, very hot. We shot in September 2018. And it was a very hot fall in, in Germany, which was great for a shooting in Mexico, actually, because it was very dusty and, and it looked great on camera. But it was also, yeah, very dangerous to catch in fire. And we had, in on the second evening, we had a fire, and I think Thor should tell the story how he heard about the fire the first time. Yeah, it was. Uh, I was in the in the costume department talking to the costume designer, and suddenly the my assistant director came in and um, he had literally tears in his eyes and he said it's burning and I did not know what he what he means by that and then I followed him and I could just see because it was this as I as I mentioned it was this vast um, plateau. I just saw the fire on the horizon because the the the, the location was actually quite far away. And um, as Lina mentioned, it was, it was really hot, so the fire was really, it, it, it kind of grew and grew and grew. And we couldn't know until that point where I was standing, I couldn't know did, whether it already reached the, the, the prefabs. And it turned out that the, the, the fire brigade came and we were really lucky because it turned out that the fire literally stopped a couple of meters from the first prefab. So it's it's really I mean uh, there was a sign from heaven really because it could have and and if you if you do an independent film you really don't have the resources to to um, to make up for that if you would have lost the locations we yeah it would have been difficult for sure but that was not the actually we also had a had a massive sandstorm I mean believe it or not I mean you don't have massive sandstorms in Germany usually. But one day I looked at the horizon and saw this black wall coming closer. And since it was, again, it was so hot, it, 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 was, it was a storm that, that then, I mean, we were almost finished with the shoot, but destroyed then the, the prefabs. And just one prefab was left, and we still had to shoot a very important scene in the prefab. So it became almost a moral question because the crew said no we cannot do this because maybe when we shoot inside the prefab will collapse and you know someone will get hurt i mean of course as a filmmaker as a director you 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 don't want to hear that you know you just want to hear everybody saying sure we will we will shoot so we had to discuss with the crew and of course it was safe i mean that was everybody was it was a man that was because we were shooting there before it was a massive it was it was well, well constructed but still, um, people got a bit scared. But we we could um, we could convince them that it was safe, and uh, thank God we managed to shoot the scene. Uh, yeah. So here you see parts of the Fuller Lodge in Berlin, <laughs> still getting set up, um, and also like so. Yeah. On the left side, you see the Fuller Lodge getting set up. On the right side is basically behind the Fuller Lodge, so basically outside here. So these windows are these windows. And uh, this is on uh, the lower left. Um, you can see like all yeah the preparations for the party we shot and all the cigarette butts we had to prepare. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, and then on the right side, um, yeah, that's part of our production design team. They were actually still working on a banner that will be later um, hung up in the Fuller Lodge in this corner actually. Um, yeah, so that's the Fuller Lodge in Berlin. 
Oh, and, uh, and now we're going to show you something super exclusive. No one has ever seen it in public. It's a making of, it's a behind the scene about the production design where you see a bit more how we uh, constructed Los Alamos or reconstructed old Los Alamos uh, in Germany. So yeah, let's turn the lights down. I'm Florian uh, Kapushi, uh, production designer of uh, Adventures of a Mathematician. This production surely have got the biggest team. <laughs> the size of the crew is mainly because it's a period piece. We're talking about America in the 40s, uh, building that all in Germany and Poland. In every building you go in, we have to dress everything, we have to change the the windows, we have to change all the lights, switches, uh, power sockets, everything needs to be changed. We found very good locations. There's Hewitz, so still existing airport close to, to Cottbus, but the surrounding looks very similar to New Mexico. They also had a former museum there, so you could use it really well for building up rooms for, for Los Alamos. And then now we're here in the studio where we do the Fuller Lodge and Santa Monica Beach House. Poland, we found a former bank house. We've got some beautiful rooms that we can tell us a friend's apartment on and on. So we're traveling a lot for this movie. <laughs> The biggest construction building site was surely more prefab road. These houses we built more or less one to one from the former time, so it was really almost the original houses, a little bit smaller. And they will be extended of course with CGI because in the long run it's cheap to have a CGI that would bring you building it. day of shooting there, quite a storm came in and kind of wrapped the set for us already, deconstruction, but luckily on um, the last day and uh, we're still able to shoot the last scene in the interior and the exterior we didn't see anymore, so it was big luck for us. Yeah, be careful when you turn the wheels, not too much, like not turning while you're standing, that will work probably. The vision of Thor, uh, Tudor and me, was to always tell the story on an island so that we are always among the people, we are always very close to the people and not getting the, this overall look, this total established look of, of, the, of the whole Los Alamos place, but being really in the story. Because of this we never had to build really high, because like, we had no crane shots or nothing, so none of the houses really had roofs or uh, yeah, anything that was about three meters was not important because we never see it. In any case, my friends, Germans will have trouble with all this territory. Yeah, I don't really have a favorite set or place in the story because there's so many different and, and each one is so unique. The first row house, it's beautiful, it has so many different areas and of course the basement where we see the first computer, the prefab road, of course building a complete road is really interesting. And I'm really looking forward to the friends apartment which we will dress in Poland. The Fuller Lodge is great to build, but also for a while it was my most hated set because it still exists, it's original, everyone knows how it looks like or everyone can look it up on Google really easy. I was like, yeah. It's going to be a hell to build it, but you can't tell Los Alamos without Fuller Lodge. And so I always said, well, it's important to have it in there, but <laughs> it won't cost us much. But that's really one of the money shots now, and uh, it turned out really well. right now I mean we have more to show of course and more to tell about the film but maybe because this is like kind of an important part yes like there the cars it was difficult to get the cars um, yeah Thor cars <laughs> Yeah, um, so apparently there are a lot of people in uh, Germany who are fascinated by the Americas, America in the 40s and 50s. You know, they 
Some of them belong, you know, there I don't know whether you ever heard the term rockabilly, for example, you know. A lot of people they, they dress like that and they go to conventions and they collect these cars. So so um, we had a very good we needed to we had someone um, there's a there's a, um, a job at a film set, it's called the prop master. And that's the person who gets all the stuff you need. And when you do a period piece, this position is even more important because it's so precise. You need such specific things. So and she had a lot of good contacts, and because she did this before, the problem with it is that um, you cannot really drive these cars on German streets because sometimes they don't. They're not. They just don't uh, fit to the regulations, or the owner is really, you know, wants to protect them, and you cannot drive them, and he doesn't want to get in a crash or something. So you need to load them on a on a trailer and then bring them to the to the place where you need them, which of course is that's the expensive part. And then you also need someone, like in a way, you when you have when you have animals in a film, you need an animal wrangler. The same thing you need for these cars. You need someone who really, because you have to guarantee the owner that the car will be, you know, will be returned as you, you got it. So you need a special person who, who knows how to deal with the cars. So um, yeah, that that's that's also someone we had. But we found them really all over Germany. And there's one key thing, uh, one one key. Uh, we needed a bus, a very old bus, because at some point in the film, the the scientists returned from the Trinity test. And they came with this bus, and it, actually, there's just one of these buses in Germany. There's no other one. <laughs> so you, I mean, for, for you as Americans, of course, you know, you see the bus and say, "Oh yeah, that kind of that type of bus." But that was quite quite a hassle to get it. And the thing is, the bus was it had no seats inside, so <laughs> the actors had to pretend that they're sitting, <laughs> which makes it even more fun. Uh, yeah, yeah, so that's... Um, so you just like sent letters out to them and said, hey, I would like to borrow your car, is that cool? Or did they say, I would have been honest when I had my car? Does it work? <laughs> well, I mean, there are uh, special, of course, there are um, uh, websites you can check out, like uh, uh, archives, but that uh, takes you only so far when you have super specific cars, you actually need to call them personally. You need to call these people and, and uh, talk to them and convince them. Um, also, of course, you need to find an arrangement money-wise, you know. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, basically that's what you do. You go, you go there and you have to convince them and, um, and yeah. And then the thing is that we had um, a quite dramatic moment uh, that caused a lot of tension in the, within the, the film team. When we shot the gate of Los Alamos, we found this very special location which um, had this dirt road appeal, you know, it, uh, and we, we, uh, it's outside of Berlin, and we looked at the location, it was beautiful, we went there multiple times. The day of the shoot, we arrived there, and the guy told, uh, told us, you know that you cannot drive on this ground with old timers, because it's too loose, or loose ground, so they would sink in, which was a bit of a unfortunate misunderstanding uh, within the art department of our film but it, it I mean we arrived there and when a film team arrives it's like the army is arriving you know there are trucks there are you know all kinds of people we are talking about hundred people arriving so that was quite a dramatic moment because every shooting day is so expensive you really cannot afford to lose any time so we had to find within the, on the same location a different spot that would work for the for all the cars but that was uh, that was really also another of these moments that, yeah, that's. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So I was wondering how long principal photography was, and then I know that period pieces are very very expensive. Would you be willing to share the budget for this film? <laughs> you don't have to. I understand if you don't want to. No, 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 it's fine. Uh, so we had 28 shooting days and one reshoot day, so 29 days, which is not a long time. Yeah, and um, the budget, if you kind of take the money we really had, like the cash money, let's say, to really spend, it was around three and a half million euros, which is, I think, around four million dollars. So usually a film like that should cost triple or five times more but we just put everything on on the screen like we try to 
put all the money on the screen and um, yeah, kind of we're very humble behind the screen. <laughs> yeah. So if, if you want, we have another clip about costumes, if you're interested in that, yeah? Okay, let's do that. My name is Justina Stolas and I am a costume designer for uh, Adventures of the Mathematician. I have a wonderful team. My second costume designer is Ada Tikovic and I have Sari Seifert and Krzysztof Wojewski on the team as well. I think that I'm very lucky because I really got together a good bunch of people who are very professional, who know they're, what they are doing, and I can absolutely trust them with everything that has to be done. The movie set in the 40s in the United States, and for me this is a new thing to do, because usually in Europe we do European 40s, as I say, like it's mostly war. But states are different because the costumes there and the life there has not been touched by war. They were more colorful and uh, they really could evolve with the fashion. We had a variety of costumes uh, that we had to prepare. We had some scientists in Los Alamos. Builders and construction workers who were building Los Alamos. We had some soldiers that were guarding Los Alamos. And thank God we also had scenes with the parties going on, some ladies that we put in dress, and it's always a pleasure to play with that. When it comes to costumes from the 40s, there are some wonderful rental houses around Europe that you can go and you can pick really beautiful stuff that is from that time. It's or it's a very, very good replica of what they might have wore. So what I basically did when after talking with the director and you know getting some idea of what I want, uh, I just went to a few places. I went to, to Prague, to Bristol, and I was here in Berlin as well. And just pick and chose things that I liked that I thought it would fit it for what I want to show and that they were fitting it fitted for all the characters that we wanted to sh to show how they look. It doesn't really hold. Uh, with, uh, yeah, but the thing is, we can, we can fix it. Then I can show it that one. Okay. When I read the script, you'd get impressions of how you think it should look, and then you start talking with the director, the OP, and the art design, and then you get an impression of what kind of movie they're making, right? So this is the biggest challenge to, to get everybody's ideas about the movie together and make the costume that everybody likes. Uh, what about the sleeves of you? Good. I don't think that the no, he should, should no, no. He should be better. Like okay. so, you know. And then you start shooting, and that's a totally different story, right? Because sometimes it happens that some sensation is done during the rehearsals, and then you are, you have actors who are falling down, and you know that you have only one t-shirt. Well, and that's a challenge, right? Because you know that you have to do some miracles that you will be able to, to have a few takes of that. So it's usually that we are just really nervous before that uh, and we use our experience to deal with it and at the end it usually works. Stan is based on a real person, right? Stanislav Ulam. And Thor, our director, really had a very specific idea of how he wants Stan to change within the, our movie. Characters is important about mathematics, but you can do fascinating things. First of all, he is a teacher at Harvard, and he's an immigrant from Poland which already been at war at that time. And then he went to Los Alamos, so the, the climate changed. We started with a kind of woolen suits, and then we changed to more linen and lighter textile, and the color changed as well. Just and then he is coming back again to Los Alamos. After he had an accident, at that time, he really inhaled American culture. He kind of loosened up a little bit and he was not wearing the jackets anymore and he started wearing volatile, which was quite characteristic to the southern states. 
of America, so we wanted to incorporate it in, in Stan's character in the movie as well, so that was the change. One of the scenes that I really enjoyed making was the scene of the party in Cambridge when Stan met Francois. In Los Alamos, I decided not to show strict fashion of the 40s because of the climate, of the heat, of the desert. I thought they were going to be a little bit laid back. And remembering that we are starting the movie with Cambridge, I thought that we will have to set the time in costumes in this scene. So it was really fun dressing people and playing with that and seeing the, the 40s that are going to come out of it. <laughs> My name is Justine. Yeah, so that's uh, I think one last photo from the shoot we have for you. Um, you can see almost the whole film team in front of the uh, Los Alamos main gate <laughs> that had to be moved because the cars couldn't drive uh, where we wanted to have the main gate. So this is already a new location. <laughs> and uh, yeah, in, in the corner you see kind of how we set up the night shoot uh, at Los Alamos main gate. Um, yeah, maybe quickly, we, we don't have that much time left before you kind of can ask us all the questions you have. But um, yeah, this is a bit more about the post-production, which is uh, takes much, much longer than the shoot, the actual shoot. The shoot was 29 days and the post-production was almost a year? Yeah. Almost a year. So, Thor, why did you use that much time? <laughs> so usually, I mean, uh, like Lina said, usually the shooting of a film is the shortest time of the whole um, uh, enterprise, so to say. It's uh, the pre-production takes usually when you do it thoroughly. It takes it takes a long. It takes also in our case years. But um, uh, the post-production is a very special thing because um, you're dealing with um, with image. You're dealing with sounds. Um, and you're dealing with, with uh, in, within the sound, you deal with sound design and with, with music. So uh, all these things are created from scratch, essentially. And in our case, the post-production took place in London, because it was, a, as Lena mentioned before, it was a, a British co-production. And um, so uh, usually, what, usually first you edit the film, which takes between two and four months. And then um, after you have a finished image, you you um, you let the sound people do their their work, and uh, sound design means that you have to find essentially you have to create the whole everything you hear, uh, all the little details and sound that you when you watch a film usually you don't realize because it, you shouldn't realize it because it should it should be just flawless, um, but uh, um, there is a lot of there goes a lot of work in in, in that. And there are simple, you know, it starts with simple question. I mean, how does a prefab, when you're in a prefab, how does it sound? You know, what, what were the sound they heard back then? Um, for example, in Los Alamos, I knew from my research that you had a guy who was testing explosives, like, during the day. So, <laughs> you want to have that, but on the other hand, you don't want to have that because you want to hear the actors talk. So, uh, I, there were, of course, a lot of details I want to put into it. And that's also what you usually do, and then you start reducing it again, and to make it really dense and and uh, and, and just leave what's really necessary. So um, that was one thing, and then the biggest the biggest thing uh, was the music, you know, because you can't have either you can decide to have no music at all in a film, which is also fine, can also work. But and I wasn't when I when I watched the the shooting and I watched and I edited it, I wasn't entirely sure whether I want to have music. I mean, something told me I need music, but then. I wasn't, I wasn't sure, but um, I came to the conclusion that we, we, we definitely need music in the film after a while. And um, so I, I worked, I collaborated with a, with a fantastic composer from, again, from, from Poland. He did a lot of, he's very, very well known. And the idea was a little bit to, um, to deconstruct the music, like to start with a very classical score and then deconstruct it in the same way that the worldview of these scientists was deconstructed because everything got, got complicated after Hiroshima. The things were not easy any longer. They were nothing made sense for a lot of them. Then, 
um, and uh, that I wanted to reflect in the in the music. And uh, it took us a long time to write the music and then to record it in uh, in, in Prague. And uh, yeah, we can we can maybe play a little 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 glimpse of it just to give you an idea what it. side up there is our editor and uh, this is also uh, our living room we were editing in the living room we started to edit the film in London but sometimes it happens during a film production that it doesn't work the collaboration doesn't work out and you have to you have to find someone else to continue and in that case this happened which also um, meant that we needed to um, move the edit to Berlin to save money and edit literally in, in our uh, in our living room, and this is my French editor uh, watching the last frame of the film. Uh, yeah, this is this is also something that um, that that can happen, and that uh, yeah, that's the production using illusion to deal with them. And maybe just to explain the rest. Uh, so the middle one up uh, is Prague with our composer Antoni Komasa Nazarkiewicz on the right and in the middle is our conductor, she's from Prague and Thor of course on the right, he wasn't conducting really, he just <laughs> looks cool. <laughs> <laughs> and then on the left down, uh, left corner, uh, you see actually a loop group, it's uh, one part of the sound where um, you have, for example, a party and you need more people than we actually had on set. You invite people into the sound studio and they have to pretend to be on a party and make party noises. So that's what happened in here. <laughs> and in the middle you have Philip uh, who plays Stan in ADR, which means um, if, for example, something wasn't understandable because of, let's say, a car driving by or also we had most of our actors weren't native language uh, English speaker, so sometimes in the dialogue you had words that a native speaker wouldn't understand, so we kind of had to rephrase it or just kind of record it again. So that's ADR, and on the right side is just at the end when the sound mix was done with our mixers and sound designers celebrating that the sound is done. Uh, ADR is called, um, it's a, it stands for Additional Dialogue Recording, uh, essentially, it's, and it's also something that's n not, sometimes people underestimate that, because the actor has to get into the same mood as he were when he was acting on set, and this is, for some actors it's easy, for others it's more difficult, um, yeah, so that's, and it was, we had to do some, some, a good portion of it for various reasons. And then? And then that's uh, what people make films for, I guess. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, yeah, it's, it was the world premiere in, uh, in Palm Springs. Right before, uh, literally right before the pandemic hit us all in um, January 2020. And um, yeah, it was really, I mean, we were really... It, there no what we can just be thankful that that uh, that we're lucky because so many other filmmakers they they either had no premiere no physical premiere of the film or um, even worse they couldn't they couldn't show their films at all anywhere because everything was fro as you know everything everything was frozen which is for uh, for our 
our um, business especially especially hard because the cinemas were, are still in a lot of places closed. So yeah, we uh, we are very thankful for that. And also, we are also thankful because um, we could watch the film with Claire, with Stan's daughter, and I'm um, yeah, and she, we had the chance to show her the film on the on the big screen. And she did like it. <laughs> She really liked it and um, yeah, what we didn't know is that, uh, I mean, our dream of course was to come back to Los Alamos and show the film to you all and together with Claire, but unfortunately she passed away last December. So yeah, we were very happy to have her in Palm Springs. Yeah, and uh, this is... The great thing that came out of all that, the film got sold in a lot of countries in more than 20 territories so far and um, every territory has their own poster and their own way because it's, it's audiences in all these countries are different so the distributor in one country might do um, a different poster from the distributor in another country and also Stan's book got uh, re-released re in a lot of countries. Um, in Poland, also in, in France, it will it will be released. And also in uh, in the U.S., uh, uh, Berkeley Press uh, releases the book again. Yeah. So so right now uh, we played over thirty festivals worldwide. Um, a lot of festivals also in the U.S. I think more than fifteen. And um, yeah, we we already had proper releases in Taiwan and Poland and uh, the US is next on October 1st as you know now and then on December 1st it will be released in France theatrically and I think in total the film sold to over 20 territories so also to China and Russia and uh, it will show in Germany and I think right now it's also on in the Middle East so yeah we, we feel very very lucky that um, despite Corona, our film kind of got a lot of interest and um, a lot of people are interested in Stan Ulam and Los Alamos and uh, yeah, so very happy to be here and uh, yeah, this is just like a quick look about some feedback we had about the film and of course um, you are extremely important um, giving us feedback after Thursday so I hope you can all Join us with warm coats <laughs> and hot tea because <laughs> it's going to be open air. Um, and uh, yeah, I think right now we are ready for all of your questions. And oh yeah, there are a lot of great <laughs> questions. So is someone moderating, kind of, or should we just pick? Just, just pick. Yeah. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Is there yeah. somebody behind me? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, you got to know Stan Ulam pretty well in all of this, right? Uh -huh. About his life and things like that. What are some of the characteristics that piqued your interest in learning about Stan Ulam? Um, the these generation of men, um, they grew up in the what's called the Belle Epoque, the times they were born, the times between the, the wars, and they were teenagers in these in these days, and they have a very special. They had a very special way of being, a very special uh, sense of humor, uh, a very good education um, and at the same time a very special sense of humor that, that you still feel to this day when you, for example, um, the telling jokes to each other is something that still people in, in Poland do or even in, in the Czech Republic when uh, Lina's dad is Czech and whenever he calls he tells another joke, another new joke. <laughs> so this is something that um, that intrigued me um, to to uh, to have this kind of um, uh, th this way of being, um, and then these people were confronted with uh, with this this incredible country they they, they came into, and uh, that they, yeah, that basically was the was also the thing that I was personally interested in because the thing is also the if you want to understand why why people like Edward Teller, who's very controversial obviously, but why he was thinking the way he was thinking, then you have to know that that these people um, also experienced, you know, Russia invading their home country back in the days in Hungary. And that, if you know that, then you see his reaction to certain things in a different light. I'm not, I'm not, I mean, 
you can still discuss about that. It's not, uh, I don't know, but it, it gives you another layer to it, and that was also something that I wanted to portray in the film, to give the audience another, another look. But sorry, uh, you, you were, yeah. you know. Okay, so we had a small kind of B-roll camera team from America and uh, we shot three days on the Ghost Ranch in ABQ. <laughs> yeah, actually uh, I, I found this location when we were doing research up here and then um, I'm personally very interested in Georgia O'Keeffe and I just, we, I signed us up for the Georgia O'Keeffe tour. <laughs> and then we were like looking around and thought like, oh wow, I mean, if we just have a couple of days and we want to shoot as much as possible on like one piece of land that is uh, kind of enclosed and uh, we can drive cars there and everything and no one will disturb us. Um, that's the Ghost Ranch. So uh, we got in touch with the Ghost Ranch and they uh, put us in touch with David and Andy Manzanares and uh, they were a great help in um, making this happen these three days. Yes? Did you work uh, with the New Mexico Film Commission at all or was that some of the problems that you had? Um, no, we didn't work with them because we kind of knew from early on that we won't have enough money to actually shoot as much as we would have loved to do here. Um, so, yeah, so we were really kind of focused on, okay, uh, where do we get some landscapes in the end and everything else uh, we have to do in Europe. Because um, if you get money, for example, from Germany or Poland, you also have to spend that money uh, in Germany and Poland, only like a really tiny, tiny bit you can go outside. So that kind of, they, they want you to spend the money where you get the money. So, yes? Okay, pine trees, big ponderosa pine trees. Did you have any in the film? Well, we have pine trees in the film. Um, I don't know if they look big to you, you have to decide. <laughs> We're not just a plateau of desert. No, no. Yeah, we have, we have actually, I think if you look um, back there is like uh -huh. one shot and uh, we have shots of trees um, in the film. <laughs> and, and did you have an American be a speech coach? Or did you have any Americans at all? Yeah, so uh, we had, I think, one American. You mean actress? Actress. We had one American actress. We had. Uh, Jack Kalkin, who was American, uh, we had an Irish actor uh, who played Jack Kalkin, but as you know, a lot of British actors actually are the better American um, actors. <laughs> no, but um, jokes aside, uh, we, had, we had, I think, three dialect coaches on set, um, also to make sure that most of the actors we had from Poland, um, also from Switzerland from France, uh, Esther Gavel, who plays Françoise Oulam, she is French. And most of them have never acted in English before or not like a big part. So uh, we had dialect coaches prior to shoot to go through the whole screenplay with them to make sure that they feel comfortable because you have to feel comfortable to also be able to play. So that was a big part uh, of the preparation for the actors and actresses. Thank you for coming. Uh, this, was, this has been great. Um, how does the trailer come about? I assume you're finished with the movie and then it's, it's made. Do you have any input into that? You, yes, you, I mean, you have an input. It's, it really depends. I mean, the, there are various trailers. Like Every country um, basically edits their own trailer. It's, um, um, again, when a distributor picks up the film in a specific country, then um, they do it in a way that Mm, that, that the audience in that in that country um, prefers it or they think they like it, but you have a say. Yeah, it depends. Uh, uh, sometimes you know because it's not. You, I mean, they bought the film, so they have the right to decide, but they consult you. That's 
Yeah, if you Google it, you will find a Taiwanese trailer that looks completely different to the US trailer. We've shown you the Polish trailer is different to that one as well. And then there is an international trailer. So we have many different trailers and it's quite interesting because the Taiwanese is so different than the US one. Um, so yeah, you should try to find it or go to our Instagram um, or Facebook because it's there. Okay, I think back, yeah, way in the back, yes. Um, so you have a, a all in all, I would say about two months, because you need to first design it, then you need to pick the materials, and then uh, you actually build it, uh, and then you do corrections on it. So all in all, the the. the the design part is also very extensive because when you're in the, st the studio, of course, the, you have to know what you're doing, essentially. And also, our production designer joined us in New Mexico, and uh, he bought a lot of rocks and everything uh, in Santa Fe, and they are um, actually well, they were in Berlin. Um, so yeah, so we had a lot of material from here, bringing it back to Germany with us. Any other question? Are there books for sale now that we give an autograph? I think, I mean, we were in touch with Berkeley Press and I think they were not fast enough to ship them. Um, but I know that there are going to be posters on Thursday of the film for free. For and free? we already pre signed them today. <laughs> so, but they're only 50, so you have to fight for one. <laughs> uh, or ask Los Alamos County to print more and get us sign them again. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you can order, I think, if, if it's not here, um, you can also order the book online. And uh, we'll be back, we'll, maybe next year, but we will sign it whenever we're back, if you're not here anymore. <laughs> yes, please. So, how well attended have the movies that have been distributed in these other countries been? Say that again. How well attended? Do you have you had big audiences when they Um so I mean uh, we had Poland and Taiwan now prior to the US and um, and, Brazil. and Brazil. Oh yeah, I forgot Brazil. Right now it's in Brazil. So Brazil we heard uh, worked very well, it's still in cinemas. Um, Poland the problem was a bit that it just kind of uh, it opened when the cinemas were opening for the first time again and people were still a bit too scared to go into the cinemas so um, our distributor there thinks um, they will make kind of more audiences while they have it on um, like VOD and um, SWOT and digital so that's why for example our distributor here Samuel Goldwyn decided that on October 1st the film will be in selected theatres but also digital so nationwide everybody can watch it also back at home um, because yeah but uh, I know that now for France it will be only a theatrical re release right now because the French really count on the audience um, to go back into the cinema and I think it'll work and were they subtitled then? Or do you plan to have them subtitled in these other countries? Or are they translated? Uh, in some countries you have, I mean, subtitles you have for sure in the uh, various countries. In some countries you have a tradition of dubbing films, as you, as you might know, uh, in Germany for example, um, which is for for the for me as a director a really horrible thing <laughs> but what can you do we actually had for the film the german voice of leonardo dicaprio <laughs> play, speaking <laughs> speaking for stan um, yeah it's it depends i mean the countries are very different in that in that sense but sub, there will be subtitles everywhere for sure um, there is actually the brazilian trailer uh, there is a portuguese version where you can hear stan speak portuguese <laughs> also be released in cinemas I think with subtitles and in Italian and I've already heard uh, Stan speaking Italian perfectly Italian as well <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
Anyone else? Yes? Um, the weather report for Thursday says we have 80% chance of rain. Mm -hmm. Is there going to be any changes to you know, the venue or you know, the times or anything? So we were just over at the municipal building signing the posters and we kind of asked Los Alamos County the same and uh, they are just I think hoping that the weather will be bad in the morning and better in the evening, um, but they didn't tell us um, their plans. Um, so yeah, let's kind of pray, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Oh yes, yes. Uh, there was a, a series of Ottoman hand fire, TV series of Ottoman hand fire a couple years ago, and they brought some of the props. And some of us have purchased them, and so we have. So, do you have any props that you are that you are keeping as mementos or, or things that you could? Uh, we would love to see some of them have some memories of the production. Of the, of the um, yeah. So most of the props were rented because we didn't have money to buy props. So a lot of things were rented also, as you could see in the costume uh, clip. Uh, actually, we had to rent things and then kind of see, mix and match. Um, the rocks that were bought here and the blankets, one of them uh, we have back at home in Berlin. And um, I think everybody wanted to have a rock or a blanket from Mexico. <laughs> and, and actually the funny thing is when um, we were shooting on Ghost Ranch. Uh, we had uh, one of the American crew here uh, in production design, and they could actually get some props from the Manhattan pro from the Manhattan TV series. Um, and uh, kind of we, we had some uh, scientists um, hiking with pueblos in the film, and uh, some props of that are from the Manhattan TV series. <laughs> But the ironic thing is that we had one uh, prop on um, on the Trinity site, which you see in the film, and then later uh, we we took it out, like with VFX, <laughs> because it looked just didn't look really good, uh, which also happens sometimes with props. Oh, and uh, we we built the Maniac actually in Berlin. Uh, that was kind of our most expensive prop that we built, uh, kind of having two different versions, like a prototype that kind of half worked um, in the story and then the kind of more advanced one. So that I think was our most expensive prop. Okay. Yeah, I think um, thank you so, so much.